The Capital Region had its sights set on the hot summer ahead this week as we approached the Memorial Day weekend. That had little to do with the weather, though, and everything to do with what feels like an impending return to normal. Ironically, it's going to be a cool holiday weather-wise. Coming up on this episode of The Eagle, we'll go over the week's top headlines. In four days, Friday through Monday night, three people were killed. We'll hear the heart-wrenching story of a local woman's search for her birth family. How does a 30-year-old woman with a five-year-old child disappear? Literally disappear. And we'll talk about concerns that some local high school soccer players are being pressured to join a private club team run by the school coach. The high school coach makes big decisions about if a player plays on a, on the varsity team and how much playing time they get. This is The Eagle, a Times Union podcast, a look inside our newsroom. I'm Jessica Marshall. If you're enjoying this podcast, take advantage of all the Times Union has to offer and support our efforts to bring in you award-winning journalism by becoming a Times Union member today. Go to timesunion.com slash subscribe. Welcome to The Eagle. I'm Jessica Marshall. Okay, let's go over what appeared this week in the Times Union and on timesunion.com. We are here now with Times Union editor Casey Seiler once again to talk about the top headlines this week. Uh, Let's start with uh, the very sobering topic of the spate of uh, shooting deaths and violence that has taken the region. Can you tell us what the latest there is? Yeah, in four days, Friday through Monday night, three people were killed. Two on Friday, a week ago, uh, really just within a couple of hours of each other both of them in the area of of West Hill and Arbor Hill. And then on Monday night, um, this uh, terrible shooting of a 15-year-old Destiny Green in a neighborhood just downhill from the executive mansion in Albany South End. It appears she was there with adults taking part in what, uh, according to Chief of Police Eric Hawkins, was a transaction that had been set up on Facebook you know, a fairly regular occurrence. And it's unclear right now, but there was some kind of confrontation with a a trio of young men who fired on the vehicle that Destiny Green was riding in. She was shot in the back, was taken quickly, of course, taken to Memorial Hospital where where she died. And these three homicides, um, three out of uh, only eight that have occurred in Albany, so far in 2021, prompted a press conference on Tuesday morning by Mayor Kathy Sheehan and Chief Hawkins to say that they were going to be taking steps to amp up patrols in the city, calling uh, in state police resources as well as Albany County Sheriff's Office, and also that Sheehan had reached out to the local FBI office to try to stem the tide of illegal guns that had been flowing into the city. And we have all of the details on all of that on timesunion.com and an interactive piece lists all the victims and all of the circumstances. So um, I encourage everyone to go and check that out. Now, moving over to our one of our favorite stories here at the Times Union, <laughs> the ongoing Nexium saga. Allison Mack, the former actress uh, turned semi-ringleader beneath Keith Raniere, has finally received a sentence date. Can you tell us more? More than two years after agreeing to accept a federal guilty plea on racketeering charges, uh, Ms. Mack is going to receive sentencing uh, likely on June 30th, but court documents say it could be carried over to to July 1st. 38 years old, Mac was really the primary organizer, along with Keith Ranieri, of you know the so-called Master Slave Club within Nexium that was known as the Bow, where you know she was one of the principal so-called slave masters um, within this pyramid structure uh, that Raniere organized. And on uh, past episodes of our podcast, Nexium on Trial, 
we listen to these extraordinarily creepy conversations that she and Ranieri had as they were walking through Knott's Woods, um, talking about how the group might be organized, where Ranieri is essentially feeding her all these suggestions, as it were, that sound very much more like, like orders <laughs> than suggestions as to how the organization should be set up, uh, how the branding uh, with a cauterizing iron should occur. Mac, uh, of course, has a lot to, uh, to answer for. And, and finally, we're going to find out how much time she's going to spend in federal prison. And of course, for more on the Nexium saga, check out our sister podcast, Nexium on Trial. That's available wherever you listen to podcasts. Um, and it's a good listen. Casey hosts that podcast. So check it out. So moving north a little bit in Cambridge, New York, there's been an incident with the local high school yearbook. Can you elaborate on that? Every year around this time, we hear stories about things that sneak into yearbooks. This year at Cambridge Junior Senior High School, it was a pretty bad one. A graduating senior who, uh, for some reason, either bad joke or actual belief, identified Mein Kampf as his favorite book in his you know, senior selections. Obviously, Mein Kampf, which is Adolf Hitler's memoir slash manifesto, it angered, uh, to put it lightly, many within the community, of course, including members of the local Jewish community, really across the region, who have said this is an indication, uh, especially in a, in a period where anti-Semitic attacks are on the uptick, that more education needs to be done to remind young people of the gravity and the horror of the Holocaust. The district began to hand the yearbooks out on Monday. By Wednesday, they had asked to please bring them all back. It's worth noting that Cambridge is already, the school district, is riven by a debate over whether or not it should change its uh, athletic team name from the Indians. It's been two decades since state school leaders asked administrators to please change those names. Most have done it. For some reason, Cambridge is uh, not able to move itself to do so. So as the superintendent said, this is yet another unfortunate uh, reputational damage to the community. All right. Well, let's move back down to Albany. So this weekend when I was scrolling on Twitter, I saw just about every single Capitol Bureau reporter that I know in this area tweet about this, and including yourself, uh, the blockade around the state Capitol and the legislative office building on State Street has finally been removed. What do you make of that? Yeah, we're talking about a two block stretch roughly of State Street that separated the actual state capital from the, you know, the Empire State Plaza had been blockaded after the first week of January when, you know, state capitals, of course, were concerned about getting their own mini version of the insurrection at the U.S. Capitol in in D.C., Obviously, happily, that never <laughs> came to pass in Albany. I, I think it was maybe one, perhaps two people who showed up, you know, Trump supporters who showed up on the date of the certification of the, the Electoral College vote. But State Street remained shut down for low, you know, a, almost five months now. And, and people just couldn't understand what was going on. There was some talk that, well, maybe they're going to turn it into a pedestrian walkway. And these really ugly Jersey barricades were, were set up. I myself rode my bike up it um, about a week before it opened up again. And yes, groused about it on Twitter. So the state with very little fanfare took those Jersey barricades away. We have not seen rampaging mobs tearing through the, the streets of Albany looking to, uh, to do damage to the Capitol. It, it has begun to seem uh, more than a little bit uh, silly. Hopefully it'll alleviate the parking situation down there, too, a bit. Staying in Albany here, staying at the Capitol, I should say, uh, the governor's offering, offering new incentives for folks to get vaccinated. Now, what is that incentive? The incentives include everything from free passes to the state fair, free passes to state parks. And in one of the more interesting ones offered for young people who either will get vaccinated over the course of the next couple of weeks or have recently been vaccinated since teenagers became eligible to get vaccinated for COVID-19, 
a, a weekly lottery that will essentially give you a full ride to either a CUNY or a SUNY school, uh, including tuition and, uh, and room and board. Uh, one final thing, uh, very exciting to me and my three-year-old, Legoland New York, after a long, long time, is finally opening up. Yes, at last. Legoland in uh, the town of Goshen down the Hudson Valley is finally opening up five years in the making from conception to reality for anyone who has ever played with logo Legos when they were younger or any parent who has ever stepped on one. It's obviously going to be a very big deal. It's uh, also creating probably more than a thousand jobs, you know, including at a resort hotel that is scheduled to open later this summer. It opened for its first guests on May 20th, but these were people who purchased what's known as a first to play pass two years ago. And then of course the general public will begin to be uh, let in on a phase basis beginning just uh, at the uh, end of the month, May 29th. That's on my list of things to do this summer. All right, Casey, thank you so much for joining us and we will check back in with you next week. Just thanks. As always, you can read more about all the stories and all the issues that we discuss on this podcast at timesunion.com. Heartwarming stories abound of adopted people tearfully reuning with their birth families in media and popular culture. Many of those reunions are thanks in part to the technological advancements that brought about home DNA testing kits from the likes of Ancestry.com and 23andMe. Shows like Long Lost Family on TLC hammer home the idea that many long-lost adoption stories have happy endings. The story we're about to hear is not one of them. Milton resident Cindy Dort spent half a lifetime searching for her birth family. What she's found has not given her much in the way of answers. Instead, she's uncovered a tragic family mystery. Reporter Lee Hornbeck sat down with Cindy to tell her story and recounts it here on the podcast. What led you to find Cindy and her story? I have known Cindy a long time. Uh, She works for Cornell Cooperative Extension, and so her job is occupant safety. So it's all these things about teaching teen drivers and try to get people to not drink and drive and car seat installation. And I've known her, I've been at the Times Union almost 19 years. I've known her, known her a long time. So I, but I didn't know this story. This came because I was following her on Instagram and she posted the missing persons poster. And I was like, man, that is a story. I wonder if she'd like to share it. And she, she really did. And so we sat down a couple of times and, talked a long time. I learned that I was adopted at age five. In New Jersey, they required that a child going into kindergarten be told they were adopted. So Cindy Dort was born Cynthia Gay in Logan, West Virginia in November 17th, 1958. And as it turns out, that's one of the few things that she knows for sure. She was adopted at three, and she was told the reason was because her biological parents couldn't care for her. Uh, She was found wandering in the street with just a diaper on. She was adopted by, this gets confusing, but the man she thought or was raised to believe was her biological father. She was adopted by his brother and his wife. I grew up my entire life calling him Uncle Dave. <laughs> and my my uncle, I called him Dad. They were my parents. They adopted me. They raised me. So they then moved from West Virginia to New Jersey, and she grows up in New Jersey. The man who raised her, her adoptive father, died when Cindy was 18, and she was really on her own from then on. I was okay that I was adopted. You know, there were times when I I wondered who 
my birth mother was, because I felt like I knew who my birth father was. There were always kind of little pieces that didn't quite fit. I mean, she knew she was adopted, but she just kind of had questions. Like there was just stuff that didn't quite really fit. When she started having her own children in her mid twenties, she just thought, you know, there's a whole piece of their lives that I can never tell them because I don't know my own history. I don't know really the full story about my mother, her adoptive family, never kept a picture of her mother, wouldn't tell her anything really, thought she was apparently a terrible person, which kind of makes sense because she was a, apparently a bad mother and they had to, you know, Cindy was removed by the state when she was three and then she was adopted. So it kind of made sense to her. They did tell me that she had red hair and blue eyes. Um, so that much I knew, but really knew nothing. Didn't know where she came from, didn't know where they met, didn't know where they got married. It was really bizarre to me. The man that she thought was her biological father wouldn't answer any questions. Her grandparents, you know, on her father's side, wouldn't answer any questions. It was very secretive. It was very confusing. You know, why won't you tell me more about my origins? I'll never forget, I was about 14 years old and we were sitting in our living room, my mom and my dad, and I still can remember we had those wingback chairs, you know, the velour wingback chairs, and we were sitting there all prim and proper. And I can remember saying, I, when I get married, who would walk me down the aisle, you or Uncle Dave, because he's my real dad? Well, my father, my adoptive father, got so angry, and he said, he's not even your father. Ben Johnson is your father. Well, all of a sudden the whole house just went quiet. And I went to ask a question and I knew, keep your mouth shut. Mm. And it was never talked about again. Years and years go by. She now has four children easy at home DNA testing from, you know, 23andMe or Ancestry became available. And her husband, who is Cindy's husband, Greg, who's watched her go through this, it's, very, it's like a torture for her. It really affects her deeply in her relationships with everybody else. It's like, why did my mother give me up? Why didn't she ever look for me? You know, who am I really, you know? So she finds out through this DNA testing that the man who was presented to her as her biological father her entire life was not. So now she's got this mystery of she's she finds out through DNA, through the family tree that you can put together through 23andMe that her biological father is this man called Ben Johnson. And there's still just nothing about her mother, Bonnie Hutton. All these things start, start coming up and she realizes in addition to this bombshell about her father, that Bonnie had a, another daughter. If after my mother leaves West Virginia and goes back to Colorado, she remarries and has another child. She has another daughter, and that daughter's name is Tammy. Eventually, through like search angels and friends helping, and she, it's cute because she's got this pink plastic expandable folder. And she's kept all these notes over the years of like, you know, she gets a phone number of a lawyer. She scribbles it down on a, on a napkin. She's got that, she's got note paper. She talks about talking to some long lost relative while she was watching one of her son's lacrosse games. I mean, it was just this kind of ongoing assembling of information, most of which led nowhere. The oddest thing was there was just no sign of Bonnie or then this Tammy, who would have been Cindy's younger half-sister. There's just no sign of her. She literally went missing in 1969 um, and has never been heard from since. Cindy found a maternal uncle. So Bonnie has this brother, Tommy, who lives in Colorado. Cindy gets connected to him via, basically via DNA searching. The brother was the last one to see Bonnie in 1969. Apparently Bonnie and Tammy had been living with him. 
she was dating this man that nobody liked and Tommy only now describes as a bad man with no reason or no last name. And so, you know, she vanishes and all these years pass and nobody looks for her. All those years and nobody thinks it's weird that she's not called or they don't know where she is. I mean, there's like, I don't know how many brothers and sisters because there's so many half ones. It's probably eight or so. Nobody looks for her. Nobody wonders what happened to her or the little girl. Like, they just go missing. You know, Cindy and her search angels really feel as though probably Bonnie and Tammy are dead. There's just mm-hmm. no trace of them, but there's also no body. Where could she have gone? Yeah. How do you, how does a 30 year old woman with a five year old child disappear? Literally disappear. So they, they're working this and they're following these various leads and they're kind of building this profile of the type of person Bonnie was and the people she had around her. And they discover what were called the redhead murder redhead murders in West Virginia, not just West Virginia, but kind of the Bible Belt and the states around West Virginia. And they think, well, maybe, because the the important detail here is that Bonnie was red-haired and blue-eyed. And we were like, oh my God, it's got to be. Like, it made sense, right? It's a redhead murder. It's unidentified. Nobody claimed the body after all these years. And so they find, there's one unidentified body because all these killings were in the late 70s to early 80s. It also fit the, like, the time frame. And they thought, well, maybe she's, she's Bonnie. So they have this, Cindy does another DNA test and it goes into a national database and they're like, we're going to match the DNA from this unidentified victim to yours. And they just really thought, this is going to be it. And we're going to be able to close at least the whereabouts of Bonnie or what happened to Bonnie, but it wasn't, there was no match. So I asked the search angels, these women, one of whom was in Virginia beach and the other is in Oregon. And that's an interesting story in itself. People that just for free kind of pick up strangers cases and say, you know, I have some expertise in wading through databases and, making you know the dna connections building out this family tree i'll help you just because i feel like someone should help you so i talked to them i'm like how rare is this how typical is it that you just the trail runs completely dry and these two search angels who are 20 years in the business of trying to find and reconnect biological siblings and parents are like it's so unusual it's so rare wow to leave no trace and I did my DNA with the police, and um, it's now in the National Data Bank. She actually is a case with NamUs, and um, they, you know, they basically are the ones that have recently told me we may never find her because we don't know if her body's been found um, or Tammy, you know. And I think now it's starting to hit me, so I don't know if I've started to cope. With I don't know that I've had enough time. After the break, a Shen girls club soccer team sparks an age-old debate over off-season coaching. I'm Casey Seiler, editor of the Times Union. Join us for an ongoing discussion on major developments in the saga of Keith Raniere, co-founder of Nexium, the shadowy upstate New York organization at the center of the explosive federal investigation that resulted in Raniere's conviction on charges of extortion, sex trafficking, and more. We talk to former members of Nexium, discuss the latest news, and preview the likely next twists in this bizarre and disturbing story. You can find Nexium on trial at timesunion.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome 
Welcome back. You're listening to The Eagle, a Times Union podcast. I'm Jessica Marshall. The powerhouse Shenandoah High School varsity girls soccer team went 12-0 this past season. They tied once. And they won the coveted Suburban Council Tournament Championship last fall. But they had to share the title with Shaker, and that's because the final game between the two teams was canceled over coronavirus protocols. During the current offseason, some of those Shen players also play for a private club soccer team called 970 United. That team is run by Holly Nurseberger, their coach at Shen. That has raised concerns among parents and in the larger regional soccer community that the team is flouting long-standing youth soccer league rules against poaching and suburban council rules against stacking teams. Some of the parents of Shen players have also voiced specific concerns that their daughters are under pressure to play with the private team, fearing that if they didn't play for 970 United, their status on the school team would be in jeopardy. Reporter Claire Bryant recently took a deep dive into the situation, and I spoke with her to learn more. Let's talk about the story. Uh, give me the give me the highlights. This story started with parents that that were concerned by how a coach at Shen had created a private club team outside of school to have the players that play on the high school team practice during the off season. And parents felt like that, you know, was a violation of some some rules and kind of a violation of what high school sports kind of philosophy is based on, which is that students should be able to play for a variety of coaches and a variety of sports um, and not feel pressure to join a club team outside of school on their own time in order to impress or get the approval of the high school coach, which the high school coach makes big decisions about if a player plays on a, on the varsity team and how much playing time they get. Um, and so parents were concerned, and I was interested in if this actually was a violation of any sort of rules. And um, it turned out to be pretty interesting. A lot of areas of New York State used to have some sort of rule that put a limitation to how many players could play on a coach's private team where, you know, they're getting paid by the athlete and the athlete's parents. And oftentimes it's, a, it's quite a lot of money outside of school, as well as they're getting paid on coaching for the high school team. And so the suburban council, which is kind of the governing body for the major high schools in the capital region, had a rule about limiting the number of players a coach could be coaching both outside of school and in school. And um, that rule was kind of under review because in a lot of areas of the state, it's been phased out and um, the youth sports scene and industry has kind of trended towards not limiting coaches on how much they can coach players outside of the high school time. Now, the pandemic, in the article, you mentioned that the pandemic affected this too, a suspension of that rule. Yeah. So the rule was under its regular review process. Um, I guess this, this comes up every year where they'll take a look at certain rules in the handbook and see if they're outdated and if they made sense. And then with the pandemic, the athletic directors in that council kind of decided that there was so much uncertainty with the pandemic and how who was playing and what was actually going to happen that they decided to, it's a little bit fuzzy, but they, they just decided to not reinstate the rule and it was under review and it's not necessarily gone. It's just not currently in effect. Gotcha. Now this private soccer club, when was that started officially? It was started last summer um, during the pandemic. Okay, so it's not it has it's not a club that's been around for a while, and all of a sudden the coach is just like, "Oh, yay! I can take more more players from my high school team." No, it was it was it was created pretty recently. Now, how many? I guess there's a ratio that was mentioned in the, the rule previously. You weren't allowed to have fifty percent of more than fifty percent, I should say, of the players on your varsity team also on your private club team. What what is that ratio like for that team? So the ratio is still under 50%. I believe that there's six freshmen, six freshmen that play on both the club team and the high school team. 
the rule itself, it's not something that the coach is violating, even if it was in effect. But the from the different coaches that I interviewed, different directors of New York State Association of High School Athletics, as well as Capital Region Association of High School Athletics, feel strongly that, you know, if students are feeling a pressure to join a certain team in order to you know, perform well or have the opportunity to perform well at the high school team, that is something that the school district should address. So the athletic director or the administration at a school should address. And it's something that parents, you know, contacted the administration at Shen and felt like repeatedly over the months, no one ever really listened to them or they they just kind of brushed it aside. So tell me more about what the parents were saying. I know a lot of them didn't want to talk on the record for fear of, you know, retaliation to their daughters on the soccer teams. But, you know, the the parents are essentially saying, like, we were feeling outright pressure to have our daughters be on this private club team. If You know, and, and the implication was that if they didn't do it, they wouldn't be given favorable positions or playtime on the high school teams, right? Yeah, and, you know, some of their their kids were already playing on club teams that other club teams um, and they felt like they had to kind of potentially break, break away from that team, which is pretty like disruptive to both the player and also the team itself break away from that team and and join this new team, which, you know, some some felt like there was a, a financial cost that they really had to sacrifice in order to have the best thing for their, for their player. What is the coach of this team, the, the Shen soccer, girls soccer coach and coach of this private club team? What did what did she say? Yeah. So what was really interesting was both her and then also the athletic director at Shen um, came from like a very different place in terms of that high school athletic philosophy of students getting an opportunity to play with a diversity of players and coaches. And that's kind of the original reasoning behind a rule or rules like this. They felt like the most qualified coach, um, which tend to be, you know, the coaches of some of these top most expensive premier club teams, should have every opportunity to coach high schoolers. And and not just them, but, you know, definitely a, a handful of other coaches and administrators that I interviewed, you know, came with a different school of thought that was more so about, you know, freedom of choice of, you know, a a coach should be able to coach whoever they want. A player should be able to play with the same coach all the time if that's what they choose. And this idea of it is good for a player to specialize in a sport and a player to really grow up with the same set of players and the same coach for, you know, years and years. And that's how they get really good at their sport. And so they, they felt like, they were doing the best, they are doing the best thing for the players too. They feel like they're offering the best opportunity for them to kind of specialize. So it really came down to this difference of sports psychology, different, two different thoughts. Cool. Well, what an interesting and complicated story. Now, this isn't typically, you don't typically do sports, right? For the times you knew you're more, you're more in the business realm. So what, what kind of led you to this story? I'm really interested in education issues as well and kind of what um, I think that high school students are put under a lot of pressure both athletically but also um, you know for their careers and you know where they're going to go to college and all of that I think high school is like a microcosm for a lot of um, a lot of different pressures and so I just got interested in this in this story because I think it's a common you know, I think anyone who's played high school athletics has seen how over the past couple decades, it's just become more and more competitive. And there's a trend for, you know, joining these premier clubs, but also joining these tournaments where you have to, you know, you travel all across the country and they take up all your time on the weekend. And not that there's anything wrong with that, but I have also noticed that trend and thought that it's seemed like an interesting thing to explore. That's it for this week. I'm Jessica Marshall. We'll be back next week with another look inside the newsroom here at the Times Union. In the meantime, check us out on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram, or head over to timesunion.com for the latest news and features. The Eagle is a production of the Times Union. It's produced and edited by myself, Jessica Marshall, with help from the Times Union digital team and the newsroom.